Sorry about the rush to get everything <coughs> done. We're going to deal with item number 11, which is the public art gift offer. And I am uh, going to ask Councillor Simpson. No, Councillor Simpson is going to move that. Oh, she's also, oh, well, I'll second she's it. also going to speak. <laughs> I'll, second I'll be it. brief, Madam Chair. I think it's wonderful. It's a gorgeous gift. And my only question to the staff is uh, $500 annually <coughs> for, it, for its um, OPEX. What is that going to cover? Cleaning. It's really just a PC amount that we put aside for response maintenance. So it um, could likely address any issues regarding uh, the base being chipped by people chaining bikes to it, that sort of touch up stuff. It will then have, uh, <coughs> over the lifespan, probably 50% through its life, have a renewal project where it gets completely repainted. Fantastic. I'd be happy to move. I think it's a good idea, everybody, and I think we should all support it. Thank you. Lovely. Move Councillor Simpson, seconded Councillor Clo. I'll Is put this that a of it? by division. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Yes, carried. That's lovely. Thank you. It's Thank you so much. <coughs> so we move now to. Um, good luck making this oh, as fast. Item 12. <coughs> Get through this just as quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, just while Kat makes and the team make their way up here, we um, there has we've talked ourselves to a standstill on this one. Um, I also want to acknowledge the staff who've brought this huge and comprehensive report to us, and the feedback that we've had from agencies and other organisations is that it's been a very very good piece of work. So. I want to acknowledge that and hand over to the team for the presentation. And just signalling Mayor Goff has signalled that he wishes to speak once the presentation's finished. Uh, kia ora koutou. I just introduce the team, as you might not know them all. This is Debbie, Kimberly, and Lynn. <coughs> Um, look, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, briefly introduce our report and our recommendations on uh, homelessness. Um, just wanted to briefly remind um, the councillors about the scope um, of the homelessness project. Um, we were uh, asked to undertake further policy work uh, to determine council's position um, and role in relation to improving, ending and uh, preventing homelessness. Uh, so that was the brief. And uh, just to be clear that that excluded um, interventions to address the housing system um, supply and demand. Um, so uh, I think it's also helpful to just remind people about the, uh, the definition of homelessness that we have used in this report or this work. Uh, this is the definition that um, Statistics New Zealand use. Um, it includes people uh, <coughs> living without shelter, so those are rough sleepers or people uh, who are living in vehicles. Um, this is obviously, or this is the most obvious uh, form of homelessness, but it also includes people that are living uh, temporarily in accommodation such as emergency housing or refuges or boarding houses or motels, uh, and also people living uh, temporarily in shared private accommodation. So these are people uh, who are couch surfing or perhaps uh, families that have moved in with another family uh, while they uh, wait, for, wait for something uh, more appropriate. Um, it also includes people that live in uninhabitable housing, uh, such as uh, converted garages. And uh, this is uh, this, this um, this group of homeless people, though, is not included um, in the statistics, so just to be, to be clear about that, because we don't actually have numbers uh, for that group. Um, the focus is on improving, ending and preventing homelessness. Uh, so just to briefly explain what that means, improving is about um, improving the experience of people that are homeless uh, so that they're better equipped uh, to move to uh, better housing uh, circumstances. 
Ending is about uh, supporting uh, people that find themselves homeless so that they don't, they're not continually recycled uh, through variations of homelessness. Um, and so that when they do experience it, it's only once and then it ends. And preventing homelessness is what, that's pretty self-explanatory. But that means uh, we need to think about uh, the people that are at risk, the populations that are at risk. And we also need to think about what are some of the, the kind of upstream determinants or drivers of homelessness and how do we um, address those. Um, I think everybody's very aware that this is a very uh, serious and significant uh, problem in Auckland. Um, our, uh, we think they're probably fairly conservative, our projections for this year, uh, that there are over 23,000 uh, homeless people um, in Auckland. So we know it's serious. We know that it's probably, uh, or it has been increasing. 52% uh, of homeless people, these are New Zealand, this is a New Zealand figure, are uh, working or studying or both. Uh, so we know that um, people that end up uh, in rough sleeping circumstances have um, high and complex needs, but a lot of the people that are now finding themselves homeless uh, may, uh, may have very few risk factors. So there may only be one um, unfortunate event or one bit of bad luck away from uh, being tipped over the line and, and finding themselves homeless. Um, Overall, in terms of the uh, response to this, uh, there's been a, quite a, a broad range of uh, responses. Uh, central government agencies, obviously, NGOs, uh, the private sector to some extent, um, and also Auckland Council. So Auckland Council already uh, contributes um, significantly and is making a positive impact. Uh, one of the most uh, significant um, initiatives at the moment is Housing First, which I'm sure you're aware of, and obviously um, Auckland Council supports that uh, in a significant way. Uh, what we do know, though, is that overall the response uh, doesn't match uh, the scale of the problem, and we need to do more, and uh, we certainly heard that from the people uh, that we spoke to. So. Uh, in the analysis that we undertook, we identified um, a set of gaps. Um, I just noted those up there. Um, firstly, the, uh, social, the supply of social and affordable housing. Um, it's very clear that if we don't address this, uh, this issue, uh, we're not going to end homelessness. Um, we identified a couple of priorities um, in terms of uh, focusing on people, homeless people other than rough sleepers. So we're not saying that we should uh, reduce the, the emphasis on rough sleepers. We're saying that's important, we need to continue that, but we also need to think about those other groups uh, of homeless people. Um, we also need to do more to end and prevent homelessness. So at the moment, uh, most of the focus is on uh, improving um, homelessness or the experience of homelessness. Uh, in terms of the approach, um, the key things, the key gaps that we identified, uh, this is from the literature and also from some of the case studies that we looked at. Um, there's a gap in terms of strategic leadership. Uh, there is no national or regional uh, policy on homelessness. Uh, there's a lack of coordination. Uh, particularly at the strategic level. There's certainly coordination happening around things like the Housing First initiative, but at a strategic level, uh, that is a gap. Uh, there is no systematic monitoring or reporting on homelessness outcomes, um, and there is no uh, sustainable uh, funding stream um, at the moment. So those were the key gaps that we identified. Um, so just to um, briefly explain uh, the options uh, that we came up with, and in particular I wanted to just um, outline the key differences between option three and option four, uh, which are the options we've uh, presented for a, a decision today. Um, moving along uh, the continuum, uh, which more or less uh, signifies an increase in commitment and also resourcing uh, from Auckland Council, uh, the first option is the low tolerance uh, option, which is uh, where we would discourage homelessness uh, through the use of deterrence um, and also enforcement. And I think it's fair to say that uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, support for this particular option. Um, the second option is pretty much the status quo. So this is what we're, what we're doing now. It's, uh, we've described it as a case-by-case uh, -case response where we uh, respond to emerging issues or uh, requests for funding. Um, this obviously includes Housing First and some of the other things uh, that we're contributing <coughs> to. Um, and it's certainly making a positive contribution. And uh, we see this as being uh, a very a significant and important platform um, on, which to, on which to build. Uh, so the two options that we have presented for a decision today, the uh, third option three, which we've described as responsive, um, is where homelessness would be rare, brief, and non-recurring. 
Um, and we would do this by strengthening the established levers that we have within uh, existing resources. So the key things that we would do um, as part <coughs> of, of, of this approach would be to focus on uh, providing uh, more strategic leadership and coordination. Um, I think it's really important to emphasise that uh, homelessness is a complex problem and it, so it requires a cross-sectoral response. And so anything that we do would have to be uh, in collaboration uh, with the other agencies, particularly central government agencies uh, that all have a role to play. So another part of or one of the things we would also do as part of option three would be to develop a, a, a cross-sectoral uh, regional homelessness strategy. Um, which would include a monitoring and evaluation framework. Mm. Uh, and we could also look at how we integrate the consideration of homelessness into council uh, policies and regulations. So for example, where there was a potentially a bylaw that may impact on uh, homeless people, how would we systematically think about um, the, the effect of that, the impact of that for homeless people um, in order to, uh, to address the position that we, that we would have agreed on. Uh, we would also need to um, develop a, sus a sustainable funding base, and obviously um, any kind of implementation uh, would need to be uh, properly costed and options um, presented. Um, option four um, includes option three, so it builds on that and takes um, a significant step further and uh, crosses the line into what has been our traditionally central government responsibility, uh, where Auckland Council would become, in addition to option three, would become much more involved uh, in the provision of social and affordable housing. So a key output uh, of this option would be the development of a um, of a, um, an affordable housing strategy. Um, it would also involve uh, partnerships for the delivery or the integrated delivery of health and uh, social services. Uh, so those are the, the, the option three and option four is what we've presented uh, for a decision today. Um, in terms of next steps, what we're proposing is that we would come back uh, with an implementation plan for either of um, either of those options, and that would include uh, the particular initiatives that would align with that uh, with the option, um, and obviously costed. Um, and we're happy to come back in the interim with a with a scope for that work if, if that's help helpful. Okay. Thank you. All right. <coughs> So we'll just take some initial comments, possibly mixed with questions. Um, just before I go to the mayor, I just want <coughs> to register a bit of a, a little problem with the, ex the wording, ex improving the experience of homelessness. I think we can do better <coughs> with wording yeah. for that. It, it just does not sit comfortably. Understand the concept, just I think we need to change the wording before we're picked up on that. Mayor Goff. Um, th thank you very much, Madam <coughs> Chair. Um, I've looked closely at options three and four, and in an ideal world, I'd be supporting option four, but I think that if we did that, we'd be creating expectations that we couldn't possibly deliver on, and that is that somehow we as a council could uh, measurably uh, improve the supply of social housing and affordable housing. That has always been a central government responsibility. And when local government has been involved with provision of housing, it has always been of housing that the capital cost of has been met by, by central government. And I look closely at that during my own tenure as, uh, as Minister of Housing. What I what I want to do is support option three with the addition of another bullet point. I don't know whether we've got that up on screen yet, Madam Chair, but the bullet point that I'd add to, <clears throat> to option three is advocacy for central government social and affordable housing strategies which directly address homelessness. Because when you look at what, what causes the problem, um, the, the, the causes are pretty clear. Uh, at a particular level with our rough sleepers, uh, we've, we've got people that have got other major social problems in their life. Mental illness is just spiralling out of control in, in New Zealand, and that's reflected in homelessness. Addiction, drug and alcoholism, that's reflected in homelessness. And <clears throat> the problem of rough sleepers is probably the worst end of the housing crisis and the one that we have the greatest obligation to try to do something about. Now, the answer to that is really clear. Um, you know, 
I went 18 months ago down to meet the People's Project in Hamilton, uh, really impressed with what I saw. Uh, they'd been running for just over 18 months. 93% of the people that they took off the streets and put into permanent housing were still in the house that they put them in. Because they said, <clears throat> if you're going to deal with this sort of homelessness, first of all, you can't deal with it when the person's on the street. Put them in a house first, and then put the wraparound services that deal with the problems that they have. And that's not just a Hamilton strategy, that's actually an international strategy, and it's proven to work. And we're now doing that in Auckland. Council is part of that. If you look at the, the, uh, the diagram <coughs> on the handout, you'll see that in the first couple of months they've, they've been successful in housing 64 families and individuals. Uh, and the goal is 472 in the first two to three years. That is making a measurable impact. And we're doing that because we've got collaboration between ourselves on council, really good NGOs that are, are experienced in dealing with homelessness, and uh, Amy Adams as Minister of Social Housing, who's provided the capital to create the houses to put people in. So <clears throat> that aspect of housing, I think we can deal with in that way. But the problem of homelessness, as you see from the stats, is much wider than that. We're not talking about hundreds. We may have, you know, we may have probably, um, I, I would guess, you know, between 400 and 900 people rough sleeping right around the city. But if you take the wider definition of homelessness, we've got thousands of people. You know, I think the figure here is probably 23,500 people. And we know what causes that too. If you need 14,000 extra houses, to house 45,000 extra people in the city each year and you're only building 10, you don't have to be very good at maths to work out the shortfall. Uh, thank you, thank you, Wayne. Um, and, and that problem is just getting worse every year. It's cumulative and, it's, and, and, and the backlog plus the annual shortfall is what lies behind it. Because when you've got a big supply and a limited demand, the cost of rental goes up, the cost of home ownership goes up, it becomes unaffordable. The way to address that is, I think, essentially what we have tried to do through the Mayoral Housing Task Force. How do we build more houses more quickly? And we've spent a lot of time on that. We've come up with a formula that has got wide support across the community, and we have to take that to government and push that to government. We've got a role to play on council. Government's got an even larger role to play, and we can do it if we set our mind to it. But the third area that's causing the problem is also pretty easy to understand. It's called a shortage of social housing. We have the lowest level of social housing per head of population for any time since the 1940s. We have not maintained the supply of affordable housing for people who cannot ever afford to buy their own home. We need more social housing, and that's what we've got to be strong advocates for. Whether it's through Housing Foundation, Housing New Zealand or whatever, we need the houses. So that's why I say we have to have that level of advocacy. I've talked a bit about statistics, but the reality is what every one of us around this table sees out on the roads every night. I was at a function, I think, on <coughs> la Saturday night before last, in town on, on Queen Street, walked up Wellesley Street, quarter of Merrill Drive in Wellesley Street there, where we've got that shelter, you know, where the plants and the bees are. There were 15 homeless people huddled in blankets and sleeping bags there. 15 in one place on one corner of one street. <clears throat> and when you drive home, and I drive home often through Bruce Pullman Park, which uh, Daniel Newman and others will know well, you know, every night you will see between a dozen and a score of uh, cars and vans and vehicles there where people are sleeping because they don't have the option. And that isn't acceptable in our city. How can we create a decent society, an inclusive city, when we have this problem? So I think option three steers us down the right path, adding that critical area of advocacy because there is no way that we can do what central government is capable of doing with the resources that they have open to us. Everyone around here knows that we're right on the level of our debt to revenue ratio. We're struggling to provide infrastructure for housing. We're struggling to provide transport infrastructure. We'd need a couple of billion to make a dent in the social housing problem. We don't have it. Let's not create the expectation that we can do it. Let's not take the responsibility 
off central government and put it on ourselves. Let's work collaboratively with central government so that they start to address that problem because we're effective advocates on behalf of those who have no voice for themselves. So, Madam Chair, I, I'll move that amendment or the, maybe if it, it, it is a broadly accepted, we can incorporate it. Um, and really happy to hear what other people are saying around the table about this problem. If you just wish to move a as it is with that additional point, that's I'll, I'll move. I'll fine. move that way, Madam okay. Chair. Lovely. Would you like to second that, yes, Councillor Casey? Okay, so that's been moved and seconded. So I've been a little bit liberal. I think. Sorry you know, with the time. Wish, no, 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 no. It's. I mean, this is one of those where we need. We just need to get on with it, really. Um, I've got <laughs> Councillor Clo, then Councillor Newman. <clears throat> if you want to clarify something, feel free to. But we can also speak to the um, recommendation. Councillor Clo. Yeah, I had Look, a. Walker. I had a different Walker. amended um, uh, B, or I should <coughs> say, um, option four to add into option three. But I'm happy to endorse this. However, just a little bit of the wording I just think is not appropriate. Um, obviously, we're going to take out option three, preferred, but. A responsive approach, because it makes it sound that it's not being progressive. Because what's been added with that extra addition is probably being a bit more progressive, rather than just being responsive. So uh, instead of responsive, should it be a visionary approach? Uh, you know, because that's what you've got down there at the bottom of page 130, in point number one. But a responsive, I don't know. That just doesn't. So I, that's one suggestion. Um, and then we're also not mentioning in there about the delivery of integrated health and social services, which, again, in the addition with the mayor there, which it could be possible to put directly address homelessness, which also deliver integrated health and social services, something along that line, mm. to make sure the government doesn't get off the hook on that. Yeah. Okay, so let's. I, I I'd just like to park the you know visionary responsive. Being absolutely blunt, I don't I don't think it's that visionary. I think it's it is responsive, and we've put a decent slug of money in, and we're doing what we can. Um, the mayor's quite right. You know, we the ability for us to put the billions in that it would cost to actually deliver what's promised in option four. I don't know if this council will do it. And we run the risk of exactly what we did with the smoke free. We promised the world. We heard from our community who came and said to us, well, you've, you've actually achieved bugger all, really, because we simply didn't put the money in. So, you know, if you are wanting a visionary approach, that's, item, that's option four. And that comes with a very big price tag. So I just... I. Okay, I sorry, I, I'm just looking at, it's got, um, it's got number one after non-recurring, which refers down the bottom to a visionary approach. Sorry, I, I just had the mover give me an, a wink to say he thought those additions were quite good. So. Uh, the, the last bullet point I think we can add in, Madam Chair, if you're comfortable with that, uh, which we, we have got a form, we've got a semi-formal partnership at the moment yeah. where we're working Thanks. with central government and the NGOs, but if you... If we want to call it a formalised partnership, that's really a reflection of, 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 of what we're doing. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I guess my, my quick version of, um, yeah, of Councillor Close was um, a vision or an aspiration for Auckland where homelessness yeah, is, is rare. An aspiration, aspiration might be the way to do it. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we hope to do. That's what we're setting out to do. So maybe an aspiration for Auckland rather than a responsive approach. Okay. Yep. All righty. I'm happy, at the top, happy with that. As the chair, we'll sort that out as we go. Councillor Newman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, I mean, I sort of feel that um, <clears throat> I'm not really entitled to participate in this debate because I have to leave immediately after this uh, this contribution. But I do support a, a hybrid of option four, actually. Um, just dealing with the rough sleepers, I have had to learn in fairly short time about the complexity of um, the needs of rough sleepers, um, and they are individual stories, and inevitably it is tied up with addiction and mental health issues, which means that the housing first approach is very important because it is client-led um, to try and assist people to firstly go into emergency accommodation, then transitional uh, with a view to achieving a more permanent solution. Um, I'm not quite sure why the public policy response that led to the um, investment 
uh, in the James Liston Hostel was appropriate for James Liston Hostel, but not, might not be appropriate elsewhere, because I think there are solutions that are um, that are capital intensive elsewhere too, uh, and there has been a lot of work that's had to be taking place at Tipuia Marae in Mangari uh, and at the Manireo Marae in Finlas and Ave. However, um, Madam Chair, I, I, I like the description of option four, progressive, set out on page 112 of the report. Um, and I'll just read from that. Under a progressive approach, the focus would be on the housing supply as the key determinants of homelessness. <coughs> the council would do, quote, a lot more. Um, that it currently does. It would signal to developers an expectation for increased affordable housing, especially for low-income households. Mm. And the council is interested in public-private partnership opportunities uh, to meet this need. I think that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't yeah. necessarily believe that it's uh, necessarily um, a prohibitively expensive um, policy objective. Um, I think that uh, it is something that needs to be addressed in a policy context, but concurrent to that, there are opportunities to achieve <coughs> outcomes that give effect to that. And I, ha I, am on, I have an established position in relation to Barrowcliff Place in my ward, and, um, and people are asking me what I think about that, and I say, look, I don't think that we necessarily have to be seeking top dollar on every divestment if there is an opportunity to achieve uh, a comprehensive policy response that contributes to the delivery of an affordable housing product at that location. So I think, Madam Chair, and unfortunately I won't be around to hear others speak and vote on this, so I apologise to my colleagues, but there are good things in the option for progressive that ought to uh, go into whatever hybrid recommendation is adopted, and if it is not something that we can immediately do today, then the policy work can continue to implement that, because, as I have said before, I think that if the development community enjoys the benefit of um, truncated um, um, uh, consenting processes, then that same community needs to come back to the table and be part of the solution through the housing policy interventions that need to be pursued in order to try and address um, this uh, problem. And I admit that um, those who can't afford their homes because they're uh, too expensive right now are different from the cohort of rough sleepers, <coughs> but it is all part of the solution, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Um, Councillor Casey, did you want to take your speaking turn? Yeah, now? but yeah. just to assure Councillor Newman that if, if anybody can persuade the Mayor and I to add in some other things, I'm happy to look at anything that you suggest. So if you've got some words, oh. we, we will um, look at them, but you might be leaving. Um, if I might just take a couple of minutes, I'm probably the, one of the longest serving councillors in the room, but certainly have done the time on homelessness yes. from my um, election to Auckland City Council in 2004. And the implementation or the development of the first ever Same homeless action plan for Auckland City. And I just want to say that I'm really proud of what Auckland Council is doing and has done. We have led this debate full stop for all the time that I've been working on it. We are still leading the debate. To have a strategy that is developed for the region is something we absolutely need. We've heard from board chairs this morning. There are issues right across the region, but hey, it's not just the region, it's the country, and I'd like to talk about that. Yeah. So from the early days of flying under the radar, we, we now have the mayor of Auckland championing this, how we address homelessness. We've got a major committee of Auckland Council accepting reports and pushing the boundaries on it. And that means that we're, we're doing as much as we can as a council in terms of <coughs> advocacy. And it's advocacy uh, that I'd like to talk about as someone who's been advocating for a very long time to dispel the myths of homelessness. And the myths still abound, no matter what. Tomorrow morning, whoever's watching this will write about it. 
And we'll see the same myths come up again and again. And we'll start by saying that homelessness is a choice. That's what you'll see. We've, we, you know, over the years, we've done the research. We don't need any more. That's what everybody who comes to us tells us we don't need to do any more research. We know what works. We just need to get the partners at the table with us. Homelessness isn't a choice. We talked to rough sleepers. When they said, I didn't have a choice, it's my preferred option, when you actually, when you actually looked at the stories, they didn't have any options. The only option left was the street. Choice is not what people do to sleep rough. The time for talking is well past. It's now time for action. Here, here. You'll, you'll read tomorrow that um, rough sleeping or rough sleepers are largely white men. If you've read this report, you'll see that Pacific are 10 times more likely to be rough sleeping. Maori are five times more likely to be rough sleeping than Pakia. 48% are women. We have young gay people who lose trust with their family who find themselves on the street. 25%, a quarter, are under the age of 25. So the profile, we, un do we, we understand the profile. That's what we've done together. We've got a better handle on what it is we're talking about. The government will try to say, well, we've got, we've got <coughs> housing first, so we've solved the problem of homelessness. You will know from this report that is the tiniest part of the problem. <coughs> and that's what a strategic plan will do, acknowledge the wider problem. Mm. There's no votes on homelessness. I've still to see, there's eight weeks to the election, I've still to see a homeless policy from any political party. And if you're all watching, do it. Because I, for one, will be impressed and might even vote for you. There's no votes on homelessness. If you think we haven't written the letters to ministers, if you think we haven't fronted every single attempt that the government's had in this room, a minister appears, I talk homelessness. I've got letters for Africa saying why we, why we don't think it's a crisis, why we don't think it's a national problem. It is. It's a huge national problem. And the answer, and you've read the report, the answer we keep getting told, we got told back, our very first expert came in 2006. Her name was Roseanne Haggerty. She came from New York. She told us that we could solve our problem in a year. It's so small. This year, we had Sam Tembaris come. What did he say? Exactly the same, 10 years apart. We don't have 50,000 people sleeping in our streets as they do in some American cities. We have a small problem that can be fixed. Now, how do we fix it? We know how to fix it, right? You all nod, say, yes, we know how to fix it. The mayor knows how to fix it too. It's about getting the silent partner, the government, to acknowledge it as a national problem. We are doing our bit in the region. They need to do their bit nationally. We talked this morning about a target for ending uh, our smoke-free smoke target 2025. Where's the target for ending homelessness in New Zealand? Where is it? If you're watching, write it. Get it out on the streets before the election. Where's the strategy for ending <coughs> homelessness in New Zealand? Be people have good ideas and they come and they say, we'd really like to do this. It might not be the best thing to do, but in the absence of policy, what can you turn to? We need a national strategy, we need national funding. Because the other thing is, it's not just about building more houses. Even if the government builds the 12,500 state houses that are needed, we still need to have wraparound services to make sure the people who enter those homes stay there. Who does that? Lifewise, the City Mission, the Sallies, and a few others. Where do they get their money from? Eh, fundraising. So those are the key drivers for the future getting the strategy, acknowledgement of the national problem, getting the funding for those agencies concerned, building the state houses, and the mayors put that in, we'll be on their case. It's my Christmas card list I've got written here, what we need from them. I didn't think you were on the Christmas card. <laughs> but the important thing is that we understand the issue here, and I, you know, I, I, I just I applaud the council for the work done. And for this being on our agenda, it's well worthy of it. And let's put it now on the government agenda. Kia ora, Councillor Casey. Thank you very much.
as a true and passionate advocate on this issue forever. Um, Member Blair. Thanks, Madam Chair. And, um, Worship who presented to us at the IMSB meeting yesterday, thank you as well. Um, so we've had difficulty kind of having the conversation of homelessness associated with affordable housing and housing provision. Um, and we're struggling because our people are at the sharp end of homelessness with the Pacifica communities. Our people are hurting out there, um, sleeping in cars as families in the suburbs of, like mm. our local board members presented today. And I've got no doubt that those effects will continue to be deepened in the health sector, education, and social uh, areas of, our, of, of Auckland City. So I'm, I'm more for us pushing towards for more social housing provision, as option four um, describes, um, only because if we wait for government to do something about it, then the statistics are showing that there's increasing homelessness or people living rough, living in cars, living on the streets uh, in our city, and we can't stand for that. Um, and I bring up the Haumaru Housing um, Initiative as a potential example for us to provide more social housing for those 52% of Aucklanders who are working, going to school, and need a roof over their heads and not sleeping in cars. They sleep down the end of my street, um, probably when we drive home from our, our privileged positions and the work that we've created. I see it more of a systemic approach towards assisting them. But these are good people that just need a roof over their head and whether we can provide through the unitary plan as well um, and putting pressure on developers to provide social housing uh, or affordable homes for, for these hard-working Aucklanders. So I'm kind of with the Mayor and the team on this, but would like to see more on page 130, I think it is, where there's a development of an affordable housing strategy or, an, or a stronger stronger wording towards implementa implementation of opportunities to deliver more social housing. I could go on and on. I think Māori are, especially iwi and mana whenua, are investing in housing. Um, the marais are stepping up. But there's only so much people can do um, with this problem. Um, we've also got a matawaka where all the other tribes around New Zealand are living in Auckland and how we can reach out to them to step up. But I think it needs a stronger lead from this council. Kia ora, Madam Chair. Thank you. Kia ora, Member Blair. Councillor Wainwright. Um, sure, just um, speaking to the, the item and also the, the bullet points that have been um, added, and I agree with those. I haven't seen anything in writing that um, uh, Councillor Newman put up, but I would have thought that a number of the things that are in option four could be added, certainly around developing an, an affordable housing strategy, irrespective of where, uh, of whether we're the implementer or it's the government. Obviously, that would um, be a phenomenal assistance to um, advocacy and, and certainly investigating opportunities and incentive to, incentives to deliver a greater proportion of social housing via new developments, particularly those on council-owned land. I would have thought that investigating was something that would also help our advocacy uh, position. So I would suggest those items are added as, as bullet points, Madam Chair. Sorry, we're just a bit distracted for a second. We'll just park that for a moment. Sorry, Councillor Walker, what was your last point? So suggesting that there are some additional bullet points <coughs> that are on page 112 under associated um, activities. They don't necessarily go as far as implement, but certainly investigate opportunities. 
uh, formalised partnerships we've already picked up, mm -hmm. develop an affordable housing strategy. I would suggest that that's a baseline. It doesn't mean to say that we have to do it, but if we go some way to developing it, then we're laying it out, and that goes to the advocacy role. Order. You can't advocate unless you've got something to advocate with. Okay. So the affordable housing strategy that you're wanting us to put there, that is my understanding is the Mayor's Task Force on Housing. That's part of the work that they're doing and will deliver. So that, I understand, is in train already. So shouldn't we have it if it's in train and we're part of it? I mean, we can restate the fact that we are doing it. I, I think what, what we're trying to do, councillors, <coughs> is to find that balance between saying what do we do that is actually aspirational. If we start to then write down a whole lot of the stuff that we're already doing, you know, we, we risk diluting where it is that we're trying to go. Yep. Yeah. You know, we've done the unitary plan. We've, um, you know, put development opportunities out there, we're working in partnership with Housing New Zealand to fast track their stuff, we're doing all of these things. If we start to name them all, we, we might forget what it is that we really need to push. So I hear what you're saying, um, I just think we're starting to over -eat well, this. I'm just, I'm just picking up on what the officers have identified, and it's one of our recommendations, or one okay. of our options, that's all. Okay, sorry, which page? What, you, you just said 121, but one... Well, there are... There are two pages. Um, effectively, there's page 137, but also 100 and, uh, 137 in the um, agenda item, and then 254 in the agenda item. Um, so 254 okay. has develop an affordable housing strategy. It's, isn't that covered under the first yeah. red bullet I, point? I think it is already there. in here. Yeah, it's My, it's <coughs> and I, I don't, I, I'm seeing kind of <coughs> nodding around there, and I'm also seeing nodding from the mayor in particular, who's the boss of the housing task force. So if we saw that as a gap, I think we'd add it in. It's already underway. Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, speak briefly to this, but. Uh, touch more on the ethnic aspect of those at the sharp end. A couple of weeks ago, a couple of uh, <laughs> weekends ago, I attended the Hikoi for Homes, uh, which was held in Manurewa, and I stood alongside uh, Councillor Newman and many in the community who were remembering and standing for the man who died outside the Tongaden Methodist Church in Manurewa. And so I think it comes with a deep sense of responsibility and connection to those particular families who've suffered the major loss that I wanted to speak to this item today. Some, throughout the report, I couldn't help but almost become emotional because I read so much that related to Pacific families, to Pacific communities. Uh, I mentioned at a meeting some time ago that we're in debates with LA as to who's got the highest Pacific population. But let's say Auckland has the highest Pacific population. Well, disproportionately, we also, in Auckland, have the highest rate of Pacific homelessness. We have the highest rate of Pacific youth unemployment. We've got the highest rate of overcrowding for Pacific families. We have the highest rate of Pacific educational under underachievement. We've got the highest rate of children living in poverty, the Pacific people here in this city and in this country. Some years ago, distinguished professor Damon Salmon described educational achievement for Pacific people as the educational undertow. Just a couple of years ago, the late Dr. Honeka described it as the brown underclass. And if we don't show the leadership and the courageous leadership that is required of this council, we are sustaining and on and creating, continuing to create what I believe is a permanent Pacific underclass. And so my intention in speaking today is to remind those who will go to Wellington and work alongside them, to remind the policy makers, the policy doers, the people around this table, as we've, as we've been already reminded by Councillor Casey, that we have a duty to those people who don't have a voice. And more and more, those people are Pacific people. And we're creating this underclass that they will continue to be a part of. And whilst we seek the leadership that's required, the courage that's required, those are the same families that are going to be gentrified out of our society. But don't worry about not having a house in Ōtara. They are being gentrified completely out of society and therefore out of participation. 
And so I'd exhort this council to vote in favour of this because I, was, I came today wanting to move option four, but I see now that we've pretty much moved all of option four, most of option four, into the option that the Mayor is proposing. But I wanted to remind this council that there is a distinct group of people who are being left out. Whether it be deliberate or not, they are being left out, and there is an ethnic component to this issue. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Hills. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's good to see us moving forward. I, I, I'm always disappointed that we don't or can't fund this type of stuff myself. Obviously, I've taken advice, and we, it's you know we would be setting ourselves up to fail in our community to build a whole lot of housing. Um, homelessness is something that's growing. I was at a um, youth conference at the Aotea Centre in the weekend with 1,300 young people from all over New Zealand. And the comment, we were sitting around in circles doing workshops, the comment that was coming from young people from outside Auckland were that they were shocked and upset, some were scared, some had no idea that, you know, when they were walking out of the conference, the number of people sleeping rough, they felt like, why is no one doing this, what, uh, doing anything about this, um, what is happening? Um, and we know that that's just... The, the tip of the iceberg. Um, on the North Shore, we have people sleeping rough. Every beach, every park, there's people um, parked up at night. I've talked to some of them. A lot of them are working. A lot of them are working in the city and on the North Shore, and they actually can't afford to live near their work. DePaul House is getting is dealing working with over 200 families on the North Shore who are facing extreme... Um, conditions around housing. They're getting a family walk through the door every single day. They've said that there's been nothing like this and the whole time they've been open. Um, you know, I know people don't like us getting political around this table, but that's what I am. I'm a politician. This is about the government and I'm glad we've got it up there. You know, it wasn't until the 13th of May last year when Mike Wesley Smith from The Nation had a compelling... TV program uh, story about the homelessness and people sleeping in cars in Otara. And it wasn't until then where suddenly f floods of money started coming from the, you know, there was things being done, but floods of money started coming to social housing providers. We started putting people in hotels, which I think is a disgrace, but it needs to happen now. The, the other thing is that if you look at the numbers, it is, and we need to put this back on the government. In 1993, Right on the Housing New Zealand website now, you can look it up. In 1993, we had 69,000 Housing New Zealand state houses. 1993. In 2000, totally after okay. that government had finished with, we were down to 59. That's 10,000 houses gone. In 2009, we're back up to 65,583 houses. We are now, this year, right on the Housing New Zealand site, are down to 62,000. In the last eight years, we've actually reduced the number of state houses in our country by 3,000, while we've got a raising, rising population, while we've got massive need, while we've got a housing crisis. We need to stop being, you know, tipping around the edges. The numbers are there. We, the government is not building state houses. The government needs to do that because we clearly can't do that or no one's got an appetite to make it happen. But we are down thousands and thousands of state houses in our country, not, let alone Auckland, and every part of the housing market is broken. Yep, we're all moving forward in little bits, but it's actually a disgrace when people can't rent an affordable state house and it has, now we're spending, you know, probably next year we'll be spending three billion a year on the housing um, accommodation supplement, which is just a, a, a waste of money when we could be investing in our own warm, dry houses for people. So this is good, this is great, but it feels like we have the same argument and same discussion every single year. But the crux of it is there isn't enough houses and there isn't enough affordable houses and, and something needs to happen. So I'm glad we've got advocacy up there, but it kind of feels like we're all being too polite around e each other when people are sitting on the street of all ages. You know, I've door knocked on houses to enrol people in, in Beechhaven, Glenfield, Northcote. I've knocked on houses where there's beds throughout the lounge, there's caravans on the, on the, in the garden, the front lawn. Sometimes I door knocked on one house in the three bedrooms, they had 14 people living there and none of them wanted to, to enrol 
because they knew that they would get chucked out of the state house because they were sharing with all their family and there was nowhere else for them to go. So they didn't want to be enrolled to vote. And this is on the North Shore, so I know how big this is. So we need action on this, but we need to keep getting louder because it's actually, nothing's changed. It doesn't feel like anything's changed and it's frustrating. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hill. So I'm aware that this is an issue everyone is passionate about. We do, however, have Councillor Watson, Fletcher, Councillor Lee, Councillor Simpton and, and Member Wilcox. We do need to deal with the very thorny issue of sports fields and do we or don't we pay for sports fields, which will be a big discussion. We're all agreeing. I, I just, I'm going to let everyone have a talk because it would be unfair not to. However, please can we keep it short? You're all agreeing. Has anyone got anything different to say? Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you. Um, hopefully I've got something slightly uh, different to say. Um, <clears throat> up in Whangapraa, we've got a lady um, who for about a year now has been um, feeding people in our community, um, I'm, many of whom are, are homeless or would come into some of these categories that, that have been <coughs> identified here. Um, this lady came up from Tokarara about, probably about a year ago now, and she had a meeting, so she came in, she didn't really know anyone in the community, she had done stuff similar down in Tokaroa, she rocked up to the local hall, she had a meeting, anyone that was vaguely interested advertised it on Facebook, people turned up, and um, she was just a bubble of energy, um, there wasn't much documentation, there wasn't much writing, there wasn't too much in the way of plans, and when I, I, I went along just out of interest, and I said, well, Julie, when, when are you starting this? She said, oh, I'll be starting this next Friday. And sure enough, true to her word, next Friday, she was started. She had the people there um, catering uh, enormous amount of food. Where she got it from, I don't know. She had contacts, and every, Every weekend, she then moved to Sunday. Every Sunday, then, then she, she has fed people on, a, on, a, on a quite an impressive scale. She's broadened her operations up to Whangarei, out to the, down to south of Auckland. She's just grown exponentially. I think, in all honesty, because I feel really guilty whenever this comes up, because I haven't really done nothing about it. I make all the right noises to my kids and that, but I've really done nothing in this council. I think... If I wanted someone who was in charge of a strategy, I'd want that lady, because that lady means business, and she realises when people are hungry, she will, she will feed them, and when people haven't got a roof over the head, she will give them a roof over the head. Our data here starts in 2013, nearly five years ago, and what I read from these figures is that um, it was not quite as bad as it is now, but it was still pretty bad if we're going on these figures, 20-odd thousand and we're 20-odd more now. In fact, if we listen to Angela and Lydia, we know it's a hang of a lot worse than that. That's really conservative. And in the interim, um, not, not, <coughs> not too much of substance has happened. And I, and I know we've, we've done some um, you know, good policy work, and the Mayor certainly made far more of a, a presence than, than the last, uh, last council in terms of, of elevating the importance of this. But as a priority, um, really, I, 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 I say I'm not doing enough, and this council isn't, isn't doing enough either. Now, I acknowledge what the Mayor says about building programs. We can't duplicate what they did in Britain in the 50s and 60s, where all that, you know, 50, 60 per cent of the housing stock was, was council owned and council rented out. We know we can't do that. But what we can do, and amongst all the fine words, is really make this a priority for us. We, we, we can't fix it by building it, but we can make it our number one priority. We don't blink an eyelid when we hear the CRL's gone up half a billion from what we were getting told it was just a year and a half ago. We don't blink an eyelid at $500 million extra, but when it comes to a little bit of extra resource for our fellow Aucklanders who haven't got a roof over their head, who are sleeping in cars, who are sleeping on roads, then suddenly you know, we're weighing up, really? What should be our priority? You know, we can have all the flash infrastructure in the world. If we can't even look after our own people, what does that say about us? So I guess, Madam Chair, if you ask for someone with a bit of a difference, 
I, I certainly put my hand up as, as just like one of those people in the Depression. In the Depression years, there were all manner of people who, who really lived apart from the, the sufferings of, of the people back in the 1930s. We're similar, I would suggest, most of us here, and a whole lot more of people in Auckland. And I guess what I would say is that it's just not good enough. And, and strategies and policies and words and visions. Uh, Mr Mayor, you, you, you've shown the way, I guess what I'm saying is that we have to get like the lady in Whangapra and have something happening real quick, not waiting another five years as we've done already while the policies and strategies play out and we end up with you know, a few more hundred houses. It's a crisis, it's here now, it's affecting our young people, our families, and I think the Auckland Council has to be the leader because no one else has put their hand up. Cool, yeah. all right, and we can pick that up in the LTP. We've got 3.5 million in this budget. I think if we're gonna ramp it up, let's have that discussion in the LTP. Councillor Fletcher. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to take a call for two purposes. One was to talk about the Pacifica population, um, and also I wanted to talk about the issue of advocacy. I had the pleasure of um, sharing a bit of time with the Mayor over lunch, but I think Councillor Collins has so well expressed uh, the real concern. I mean, what is the point of difference um, over and above mana whenua? It is our Pacifica population. I, you as a committee have heard me talk about this time and time again, and I hope when we come to the Auckland Plan refresh, we are prepared to articulate that and actually point out that point of difference and be proud of our Pacifica population. But as Councillor Collins has very well articulated, we are seeing institutionalised poverty now amongst them, and there aren't the strategies for that Pacifica population to, to really come to grips with, with some of the social policy changes that need to be made. The, the concern that I've got, and I've again expressed this now with some frustration in recent years, and I'll liken it to the transport problem. Councillor Lee and I will say to you, everyone's very proud of ATAP now, but ATAP was years in the making. It was years in the making to get some common language between central government and local government. And we've actually gone beyond just officers talking to officers between central and local government. We've got politicians talking to councillors and mayors now. And that was, that was the cut through, that was the breakthrough, but they, they needed to have to come together and for everyone to, to accept that there, there is accountability both for central government and local government in getting those solutions coming through. And I believe the same is true in social policy. If we think it's just homelessness and, and we've, we've got a whole raft of issues that we need to be able to have genuine dialogue with central government and funding coming through from central government. And I don't believe what the mayor is proposing today goes far enough. I think we've really got to formalise whether he would give consideration to some structure or some committee, as other council has done in the past. Um, I mean, Councillor Casey's done a superb job in the advocacy on this, but she can only bring it to this committee. I would like to see her down in Wellington. You know, God forbid that Bill English has has Kathy full on when she's in. She's. <laughs> or just send her for that. <laughs> but you know, we've got a looming teacher shortage. We've got a. There are a whole raft of things that are coming Auckland's way. <coughs> and I think that we should be willing to actually look at a group and giving them a mandate from this council to say, go down and engage with your counterparts in Wellington and do not let them off the hook. That is the only way we made progress on transport because we actually formalised it. We didn't just put in some weak little add-on, oh yes, well we'll go down and advocate for it. Yes, we have a crisis. <coughs> It is acknowledged, and hearing Councillor Watson, it makes me want to cry. I mean, we've got people, hands, that are doing things now, but they're looking to us for leadership on this. And the leadership that we can provide in a governance sense is actually allowing those councillors amongst us, like Cathy, like Councillor Casey, um, that will be fearless, they will be formidable and relentless in actually getting to Wellington and, and seeing um, 
I, I think the, the sorts of solutions that need to be brought together. So I, I know that you're short of time. I'd like to go on about um, this, but I would like me to consider, I think it's a bit weak at the moment. I don't think anything's going to come out of that. I'd like him to look into formalising advocacy on some social policy areas in a formal committee with a mandate given to those councillors to be advocates on behalf of the council. Great to have the officers. Yes, they're wonderful. But I don't believe that you're going to get that cut through until you actually put the elected members in face to face with the, their counterparts in Wellington. So mm. thank you. Well thank you, Councillor. I think we can pick that up separately as follow up to this. I think the key thing for advocacy, we can put the words in here, but we need to know what the shopping list is. And the starting shopping list might be MSD are looking to purchase 1,900 um, social housing places by 2019. They actually need to be purchasing 12,460 to end homelessness by 2019. That feels like a very good advocacy point to me. And I think we need, if we're going to do it and we're going to send people down, let's be clear on our shopping list. We've done a lot of advocacy. Some of it's fallen on deaf ears. I think we need to be clear. So let's pick that up separately and not try and do the shopping list now. But your point is very well made. Councillor Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Just to come back to the agenda item, the purpose is to decide on Auckland Council's position and role <coughs> in relation to improving, ending and preventing homelessness, which is uh, a, a, a noble purpose and very, very amb ambitious and one that we would all support. Uh, but in terms of our role, um, undoubtedly our hearts collectively are in the right place. Um, we care about this. We believe that something must be done. Um, but is that enough? Um, how would the people who are currently homeless, would they be reassured by our good intentions? In other words, are we doing enough? Uh, are, have what we, done, what we have done in the past worked that well? Um, and how, how can we improve on our own performances. It's about us. I, I've heard a lot about the government and they've been criticised, and quite rightly so. Um, our advocacy on behalf of the homelessness or the homeless um, <coughs> should certainly in, include uh, blunt comments about the government. I haven't heard the Auckland Council really criticise the government much about anything, really, in the, in the last six years of the Super City. I've heard the government criticise Auckland Council, um, but in terms of our ad advocacy, perhaps we need to be a bit more pointed. However, um, there are limitations on that, because uh, there's an old saying from the Bible, I believe, by their deeds, so ye shall know them. And we can certainly quote, the appalling figures um, in terms of building state houses, um, the record of this government, which is poor indeed. But then again, someone might look at the houses and housing stock that the legacy councils used to operate and compare the role of the super city in providing housing. Because... Providing housing was a core role of major city councils. Not, you know, providing housing by councils um, was secondary to the government's role, but it was an important role. And we, in recent years, have retreated from that, that role. So in terms of criticising the government, we need to perhaps search our own souls in regard to our own performance in this area. Obviously, the problem of homelessness has got worse in recent years, despite a booming economy, and obviously um, solving homelessness in Auckland would be beyond the resources of this council. But we can do... Uh, take some steps, some practical steps, I'm sure. 
We've got a lot of stuff about advocacy and strategic leadership and committees and monitoring, but not much really about practical work, uh, uh, practical steps, practical initiatives to solve the problem. As I said, it's a major problem and too big for us to solve um, on our own, but we could take, tackle some aspects of it. Uh, rough sleeping, for instance. We've heard about the rough sleepers, and we know that people who are waiting are, are on a, 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 a housing New Zealand list or living with their families, uh, living in garages, they're the poor. That's poverty. But the people sleeping on the street not far from here, that's destitution. That, those people are our fellow New Zealanders. They're our fellow Aucklanders. And I think it's important that we do something practical to ease their plight. We had a, a submission earlier on behalf of uh, Audrey Van Rin, uh, who's uh, a, a social activist who chose to live in the inner city, essentially because of the um, closeness to cultural amenities like the art gallery and theatre and so on. But every day and every night is con confronted by people sleeping on the road. And that offends her conscience. And she has tried to do something about it and is still trying to do something about it and is asking our help. And in terms of helping the rough sleepers, we certainly could do something with our resources about a night shelter. Um, that is certainly not beyond our capability. I believe that apart from the strategic leadership and advocacy stuff that we've been doing in the past, without really having much of an impact, to be honest, um, needs to be also augmented by practical steps to deal with the rough sleepers, starting from the inner city and working our way out. These are the people at the bottom of the heap. These are the people that even if Housing New Zealand stop going to the Environment Court and stop going to the High Court to back up the property developers and actually started building houses, these people still couldn't cope because many of them, most of them, I dare say, are actually people who once would have been in a psychiatric hospital, being having proper wraparound services, being looked after, cared for and housed. And therefore, I think that we need to do um, something practical to help those poor people, those fellow citizens, rather than just advocating and talking and having aspirational intentions. We need to do something practical, and I think um, that needs to be factored in as part of, of our menu, if you like, of, uh, of initiatives that we should take. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Simpson. I'll be very brief, Madam Chair. There's one, but I think we've missed out. We've talked about ourselves and what we can do. We've talked about working with government because we know that they have a vital role. But there's a third uh, part, I think, that we um, have forgotten, and that's the private sector. And um, some of you will know some of the work that um, has been done by private individuals to assist with homelessness. So I'm just suggesting that last put bullet point, working with the private sector and, and then you keep going, formalised partnerships, because I think it is a, it's an area that we haven't addressed, and um, I, for one, know private individuals and organisations who are already contributing and want to continue contributing, and I think we should welcome that. Okay, so mm. just adding into the last bullet point, working the with the sector. private sector. Yep. And, and then keep going. And, okay. Good idea. Finally, Member Wilcox. Thank you, Madam Chair. I suppose I've just got a couple of questions first. And I just want to know, I see the, the, the story there about levers. So the unitary plan mentions affordable housing and the onus on developers. Have we ever used that lever or what's happened to it? Uh, through the chair, 
that requirement for affordable housing um, is no longer in the operative unitary plan. <coughs> mm. So we took it's it taken out. out. Yes. So right. the devil's in the detail. You've got monitoring and evaluation up there. What exactly is that? Is that a dedicated unit that's going to do this monitoring and evaluation? Or are we just seeking it in a broad, generic way? It could be a dedicated unit for monitoring and evaluation, but generally it was using existing baseline resources where possible. So we do have REMU already. It was also um, about partnerships with government and um, in lots of the things they do. So a lot of the big longitudinal survey work is undertaken um, and paid for generally by government and it's about what partnerships and additional information from that. So as part of the implementation plan we'll need to scope exactly what that is. We don't have a lot of money though for new information so monitoring and evaluation wasn't really for new data sources at this point. Okay, so then, I mean one of the things that we've left out from option four has been to investigate opportunities to deliver social housing to support advocacy to central government, but we're kind of getting there in a way. So what's the unit that's going to be doing that? Or are we not going to do that, or are we just going to rely on the information, which I've heard is goes back to 2013? So generally, yes, we'll have to rely on government information as the key source of data unless we fund unique data sources ourselves. Would be silly doubling up. So, Madam Chair, then would we be seeking that through an LTP process? For the research or the, the purchase of data or the actual funding of, yeah, I guess... I mean, you can answer that, Kat, but that's part of, we we have got some funding in there, I understood, for us to do research. That's our contribution towards Housing First is some of the research money, but if we want to expand that, then we will have to do a bid through the LTP to expand the available ability to research. Just through the Chair, whatever option that is selected by this committee, there is a part of going, there are a range of actions that can be attached to that option that this committee can decide at, over time which bits it wants to fund as a priority and which bits it may not. Monitoring and evaluation will be one of those things that you can make choices about and then over time see about funding. I suppose we would, um, promote, trying to work best with big government and research organisations on data sources that they have and where sometimes we might be able to purchase larger sample sizes for Auckland or influence additional questions into those surveys. So, um, because they're longitudinal and they're very expensive but that it enables us to track accurately over time. Okay, so I'll just have a quick quote at all. Um, you know, it's 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 all right for us to be talking about this, you know, but you know, there's no mana without manakitanga, and Auckland's mana rests on us being leaders in this situation. Our people are really struggling, and I mean, it's not only Māori, it's not only Pacifica. We've yet to even investigate Asian homelessness, let alone any other community group that's that's facing this same problem. I mean, I hop on the train from Papakura every day and I see on the way up everybody, every shed, and there's a family living in it. Homelessness all the way up to, all the way up to, up to Manurewa, every shed, and there's a family living in it. Homelessness is not a new problem, it's just that people now can't get out of the shed like they used to before. That's the affordability issue that's occurring. I really liked option four. I felt it really produced the goods and it led a way that we could say to, to New Zealand, Auckland sees a problem that needs to be solved. I mean, we've had this problem now created 
since the 80s in, in New Zealand, since the late 80s, this problem has been compounding itself and now it's, it's turned into a nightmare because most people can't afford, never, never, never mind living, uh, buying a house, most people now can't afford to rent a house. You know, I'm, here I am whinging about taking two hours to drive in on the motorway. Some people don't have that problem because they're sleeping outside their work. So, you know, we need to, to make this change I'm really, I know it's aspirational, but we actually need to be more than aspirational. We need to be saying this is what we want. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to support <coughs> Christine and what she said is that we need to have definite advocates going down to, down to Wellington and they need to be supported by hard data, but it's actually people's lives we're talking about. Data really reflects people's lives. And there's a whole, I'm glad to see that we've got the non-government organisations, the integrated health and social services, because homelessness affects education and it's this underclass of people that is becoming a larger and larger issue in this city. So yes, I'm, I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Wilcox. I think we've reached the end of the speaking list. I just want to acknowledge the really thoughtful contribution by everybody. This is the single most important issue we're going to deal with because there's no point in everything we do as a council if a huge number of our community can't even access what it is that we're trying to do around this table. So I just thank my colleagues and our staff and everyone involved. Mr Mayor, thank you for your leadership on this and Councillor Casey, thank you. I'm going to put the recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Unanimously. Absolutely. And that's a really, really good message to send. To if we are going to package you up and send that to Wellington, you're going with a good mandate, Councillor Casey. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you staff. Um, we are going to um, try and complete this. I'm going to move an extension of time.